So I'm glad to see this massive crowd here today. Um, <laughs> kind of nervous, all the chairs are full for those of you at home. Um, but uh, so I'm gonna start with the story. So you're sitting in the big chair on the adult pod. It's your fifth of five shifts in a row. Uh, there's 12 waiting to be seen on the board. Most are in AC chairs. You go to a uh, nurse actually approaches you and says, hey, can you come look at this patient with me? Is that better? Okay. Um, and the nur nurse says, hey, can you come look at this patient with me? So you walk into the room and you see the orthopedics resident doing chest compressions. <laughs> she hands you a large syringe of something you're not sure and says, hey, I'll be in treatment for you. You're really confused and you're wondering why there's just an orthopedic surgery resident in the room and you scream for help and you poke your head out of the room and you are looking for your attending. You see Mike Kimini dressed in a short white coat introducing himself as the medical student and you realize something's terribly wrong. You hear Bon Jovi playing over the PA and all of a sudden flash. You realize it was just a dream, it's nine o'clock and your alarm's playing in on a prayer. You stagger in your way into work, upset that this is actually just the start of your fifth out of five in a row, but you feel on edge, a little more snappy than normal, and it's a certain kind of brain fog that you can't quite figure out, but you've just decided to live with. Um, on your shift, you don't feel so inclined to laugh as you normally would, and you find some of the banter annoying, and questions you would normally answer calmly, you blow off. You throw back your Red Bull and keep on going. Sleep is a central part of our existence. You've doubtlessly heard several statistics aimed at how you need seven to nine hours of sleep at night. You've watched as your friends have transitioned from party animals who go to bed at two or three in the morning to going to bed at nine or 10 o'clock, um, sometimes earlier. The world functions on a nine to five schedule, but your workday is just starting. If you had asked me about emergency medicine ups and downs as a medical student, I'm not sure I would have picked rapidly alternating sleep schedule as something um, that would be a potential downside. The reality stands that I'm honored to serve people at their most desperate time, but I'm not one of those people that can sleep anywhere, and sleeping effectively is something that I've had to learn how to do. So how exactly does one sleep in emergency medicine? What can we use to inform us? And while we certainly count as shift workers, we are special because we often walk the line between day shifts and night shifts and never belong to just one. If you were to ask my sister, Karen, who's an architect, to help design a building, she would ask several questions of me, including what's the purpose of the structure, any constraints I have, and budget, just to name a few. So as we go to design the structure of our sleep and emergency medicine, maybe a reminder of what we're working with is in order. For starters, the machine, our bodies, our, which powers our sleep, are kind of fickle things. They don't just turn on and off. For this machine to function effectively, it has to be given time. Here's a graph which details the progression of sleep over a normal night for somebody who's sleeping on a normal night schedule. I'm not going to go into all the deep you know, intricacies of each stage of sleep, but notice that REM sleep, where we have most of our dreams and memory consolidation, um, progresses overnight and gets longer as we sleep. Additionally, REM-3 sleep is the phase where we're thought to gain our restfulness that's needed to continue in our next day. As we age, our REM sleep periods get shorter. Um, our frequency of sleep increases, but we end up sleeping more. And additionally, our bodies do better at night. On our night shifts, you can imagine that our REM sleep gets cut in half, at least sometimes and so we're not as rested overall. So what things happen with our bodies if, we, uh, if our sleep is not routine? You all know that feeling at this point, and it's not routine, or it's not ideal for most people. We know that some people are impacted more strongly than others by uh, sleep. I know I'm probably on the heavier side. I think, I think we're actually, we're doing okay. Yeah. You're still on the presentation. It's okay, we're good. Um, so, <laughs> You know you might have a problem if you look at your uh, jet-lagged friends and say, oh, that's the way I always feel. So what sacrifices are asked of you as you endeavor into this career of emergency medicine? What burden do our bodies and minds carry every day? On average, day sleeping is known to be one to four minutes shorter than night sleep. 
This problem has been well described since at least the 1700s. In um, Bernardino Rambazzini's De Morbis Artificum Diatriba, he describes bakers of his time. He said, they work at night. When they sleep, others stay awake while trying to sleep during the day like animals who escape the light. Hence, in the same town, there are men living an antithetic life in comparison with others. Other side effects of sleep loss associated with shift work are many. Shift workers have increased GI complaints, including diarrhea and upset stomach. They're at about 30 to 40% higher risk of developing coronary vascular disease and increased levels of lipids, cholesterol, uric acid, just to name um, a few, uh, which return to normal during normal day shifts. Chronic sleep loss is also associated with increased risk of psychiatric illness. If, um, see, I think I missed slide. There you go. Um, if rapidly adjusting schedules are a problem, is fixing our schedules in one place a better option? Perhaps it's a cheap quantum sauce to note that people who are purely night shifts aren't really any better off than those of us who rotate their schedules frequently, at least as it pertains to their uh, lab values. I don't really remember my first night shift of residency or my second one, but I do distinctly remember my third one. I remember getting in my car to head to RUHS at 9.30 at night. I had called my mom uh, asking for prayer and for encouragement because I didn't think I'd make it through the night. I didn't think I'd be able to make uh, sound medical decisions for my patients just because I didn't think I could stay awake. And my first thoughts were, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do this forever. With the foundations of my sleep shaken and sometimes seemingly broken, how did I go about rebuilding the four roofs or four walls and roof of my sleep? Um, what tools have I used and how can we improve our work, our sleep um, with the work that we have to do? Let me share with you what I've learned in my own personal experience in emergency medicine with my uh, four walls and roof. So shifts, shifts are uncontrollable or at least in residence here, so that's what people say. While what comes through the door might be something as simple as gastritis or a patient with a pneumothorax violently whipping a chain, I think <laughs> I've learned that there's more we can do to control the meets the eye, at least for me to ensure that I can get good sleep when I go home. I drink at least a liter and a half of water while I'm on shift, but I make sure that I stop drinking about an hour before my shift so I don't have to use the bathroom once I'm asleep at home. During day shifts and afternoons, I do I eat whatever I want to, best food group ever. Um, but at nighttime, I, and I try to, sorry, and I try to mimic the times that I would normally eat so it's not any closer than two hours to when I go to bed. I know that night and swing shifts generally aren't conducive to health, so I usually eat some form of berries and salad and maybe a protein shake. While not something I always can control, I try to limit the stimuli that I have in my last hour of shift and tell myself that I'm gonna be going to bed in the next couple of hours. So what's the second wall? For me, that's mindset. Who's ever come home from a shift with the events of the last 10 hours still repeating in your head? I should have ordered this test. I should have placed that chest tube faster. I can't believe that person said that. That trauma was really bloody. I look for the excitement as much as the next guy, but it makes no sense to shut my body down while it's still running at full tilt. And we're in the best way around this is to um, do something mindless for about an hour before I go to bed that doesn't involve heavy processing. It usually involves watching a comedy that I've seen before or diving so deep into the YouTube hole that I seldom return. Shout out to Mega D and Tori and my little ER family for listening to my YouTube adventures. Uh, anyways, once I'm confident I've traveled far enough away from the world of blood light traumas and 5150s, I do only then rest my head. In short, I'd encourage you to do whatever you need to do to put your head in a good place before you go to bed. Personally, I found that if I don't do this, I sleep about one to two hours shorter on average. Lastly, the last thing I'll do before I go to bed is remind myself of the things that I'm thankful for. Each day, I verbalize 10 things specific to that day that I'm grateful for. This is a reminder that even though we deal with difficult things, we're very privileged to have the career that we do. Um, environment. So this is the third wall and this probably constitutes the, um, the cornerstone of effective sleep for me. I use something that appeals to each of my senses in a way that is going to calm me down and remind my body that it's in a safe place. 
or sight, I don't want to be able to see anything. Are you familiar with the German term Zeitgeber? It describes environmental cues. <laughs> it it uh, involves uh, environmental cues that try to correct your body to a normal day sleep schedule. But unfortunately, that means if you're walking outside from a shift and you see the light after the nighttime, that your body's going to think that it's awake. So I try to minimize this input as soon as I've left the house. Um, in the same way, darkness tells your body it should be asleep. For me, blackout curtains were single-handedly the best purchase that I made my intern year. And I keep them closed before I leave for an overnight shift so that when I come home, my room is dark and then I can go to bed. I also wear a face mask and, uh, and uh, up over my eyes to ensure as little possible sunlight. What about sound? Earplugs and a fan, always for me. I go so far as to not have my radio on when I'm going home so I don't get those earworm songs stuck in my head as I'm trying to go to bed. Um, for most people, these two senses are the ones that impact them the heaviest, but I'll make a point that I think that the rest of our senses can actually impact this too. As far as smell goes, I bet none of you thought that I'd be here promoting essential oils, but this is actually maybe one spot where I think they may be okay, and that's because they smell good. Mike's shaking his head. <laughs> um, um, so for me, that usually will either involve buying a candle that I found at Kohl's on sale or something like that, and it smells good and it makes me feel safe. Um, touch. Has anyone seen one of these before? Does anybody know what it is besides a dog? <laughs> It's it it's a thunder shirt. I guess we don't deal with too many thunderstorms in California, but uh, in some dogs, this compression feeling that these shirts provides help them stay calm during the storm. And the same thing actually works on us. The thought being that it feels like a hug, and so we feel safe. Um, ever slept somewhere really cold and crawled into a bed with a super heavy comforter? Funny how they're called comforters, right? Um, and have the best sleep of your life. Well, that's because we generally sleep better in cold environments and with that feeling of being safe or being covered. So consider this when you're choosing your bedding or building your sleep environment at home. What about taste? Just brush your teeth every little bit later. Um, medications, this is the last wall in my building, I suppose. Did you know that up to about 40% of ship workers and residents at any time say that they're using sleep medication to help them, um, help them sleep? The most common classes are non-benzodiazepine hypnotics, antihistamines, alcohol, which we don't recommend, and melatonin. Less common still are benzodiazepines, but obviously waning in favor because of uh, dependence. One of my favorite terms in relation to sleep is the word chronobiotics, which describes medications used to entrain people's uh, circadian rhythms, the most well-known being melatonin. Rather than using melatonin as a sleep aid after every shift, regardless of the time that I'm going to bed, I've decided to use it only at nighttime to help entrain my lost sleep. Uh, a 2014 Cochrane review showed that melatonin has a weak evidence for promoting sleep at any time of the day, but given its capacity to help us correct our sleep schedule, I only use it at nighttime. One other thing maybe worth noting is that an, ob an observational study um, in 2015 dosed a, or tracked a dose response in patients 65 and older on any number of different anticholinergic medications, including TCAs, antihistamines, and antimuscarinic drugs, and found a all-cause dementia dose relation response. So while we are younger than that population, it might be worth noting that taking antihistamines and anticholinergics over time could potentially have some um, impact on your development of dementia in the future. However, I think future um, studies are in order I know for me, at my worst during residency, I've used Benadryl every single day, even when I'm not working. And at this point, I've been able to cut back, which is good, using some of these techniques that I've described. Um, so what's, the, what's your recovery game, I guess? This is the consists of the roof for me. The last few years, I know I've learned that there's a definite consequence to um, long stretches of swing or night shifts, and recovery game tactics are important. I know I've talked about medications, but choosing your normal is perhaps the most important thing that you can do. Um, I know that abnormal as far as shift goes is normal in emergency medicine, but your sleep shouldn't be. Has anyone heard the term anchor sleep before? Anchor sleep describes a, um, a period of sleep where you sleep every day despite the time that you would be working. 
So a good example of this would be if you were on a long night block and you're sleeping after your shifts, if you slept from eight o'clock in the morning till four o'clock in the afternoon on your, um, on, your, on your days that you're working and four o'clock in the morning till noon on the days that you are off, think about that for a long night shift, that period between eight o'clock and noon would, consider, would be considered your anchor. This works great for a lot of people, and for those of you who aren't good sleepers, I encourage you to do that. It's not something that's worked personally for me. So what I have done is called my own anchor sleep, where I choose to um, sleep until my body wakes itself up after a shift, which is usually four or five hours, and then sleep for about two or three before I come back to work. Even if I don't fall asleep in that time period before I come to work, I rest with my eyes closed and I don't move, and it has a definite impact on my sleep. So I think there must be something to lower stimulus as you're, as you're um, trying to rest. What about troubleshooting your sleep? What do you do when things go wrong? Who's ever woken up in the middle of the night, not sure what time it is, only to realize that it's too early to get up, but it's too late to just stay the way things are? Who's looked at their clock, anyone? I'd actually encourage that you not do that. A 2007 study in uh, the Journal of Behavioral therapy and experimental psychiatry showed that patients who try to look at their clock frequently before they go to bed actually end up having delayed sleep onset and sleep less. While perhaps extrapolating a bit, I choose to not look at my clock at all. Well, I hope I've given you at least a little insight into my journey while sleeping in emergency medicine as somebody who doesn't have the talent of innately being able to sleep anywhere. If you had at least some struggles like me, I hope you've learned a few things and you're not alone. And if not, and if I put you to sleep, I've still won. <laughs> I have one more story for you. You wake to find yourself in an unfamiliar place with your stethoscope around your neck and monitors pinging quietly in the background. You feel a little unsettled by the unfamiliar location. This isn't Detroit anymore. Slowly, one by one, new faces file their way into the room, slightly obscured. They're friendly faces, and you wait eagerly in anticipation for them to be revealed. The scenery changes rapidly, and you think you catch a glimpse of a hospital gurney, a classroom. You find yourself increasingly at ease despite the occasional scary or gruesome scene. The people standing with you seem all the more clear, and you're calmed by their presence. You pinch yourself and find that you're not dreaming at all, and that the people besides you are real, your best friends. You rest in the fact that nobody can take the experiences from you and that you have a bond for life. And if that doesn't help you sleep at night, I don't know what will. Thanks.